Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> thank good morning. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so welcome back for, for day two of this phenomenal um, convening dem democratizing data. And we're here to talk about artificial intelligence and effective, com effective communities with a panel of phenomenal um, uh, activists um, and lawyers um, <clears throat> on this topic area. And so I want to begin by just introducing our panelists very briefly. Um, and then we'll kind of go uh, in order with Rashida um, Richardson, who is Director of Policy Research at AI Now, um, Sharon Hom, who's the Executive Director of the Human Rights in China, and the Adjunct Professor of Law in NYU School of Law, and Hamid Khan, who's an organizer with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. So I'm going to start by kind of asking each one of them to give us some sense about how their work um, fits into this larger conversation about community-driven strategies to address violence and harm that's widely understood to be the product of artificial intelligence. And so I'll start with Rashida, then proceed with Sharon and, and Hamid. Um, and with that, I'll turn the floor over to Rashida. Hi. Um, so I work at AI Now, which is an interdisciplinary research institute based here at NYU. And we focus on the social implications of artificial intelligence. And I serve a dual role as both a researcher and leading our policy advocacy. And I'll just start by framing how we sort of view our approach to the work and then concretizing it in an example of how we're trying to actually actualize that vision. So in general, I think when people hear AI, you think sort of Skynet, other <laughs> sort of technical <laughs> systems. But I think one of the um, most important parts is that even though artificial intelligence is an umbrella term that refers to many different types of technical systems, they're often applied in social domains that are very nuanced and complex. So doing any type of research or even advocacy work in this realm, I think, requires socio-technical analysis. And to do that, we try to center two groups who are often left out of the conversations. One are domain experts, um, not just from one side, whether it be government or tech companies, but actually people with experience in, that breathe, breathe and live the work of certain social issues. So that means practitioners, whether um, legal organizers, advocacy um, participants in specific issues, whether it be criminal justice, child welfare, um, education and then also we want to push how we think about expertise because I think often in this country especially we see it as a list of degrees that comes after your name and I really think that we need to start valuing elevating and centering lived experience and positionality to issues because sometimes that type of insight can be even more useful and helpful in understanding the impact of these issues um, so the way that we've been trying to actually make that goal and approach of reality um, is probably best seen through some of the work that I'm doing here in New York City. Um, back in 2017, the City Council, which is the municipal body here, passed the first of its kind law to create a task force to look into automated decision systems. And automated decision systems are technical systems that either aid or supplant decision making in government. So that all of the uses, whether it's a system that decides whether or not you, get, you go to jail before your trial, a system that decides where students go to school in the city, who, um, whether or not a family will receive a check-in from a social worker, um, for a child welfare case. So many different sensitive areas where systems are being used to either aid or completely make decisions um, for government officials. And the task force is not only tasked with figuring out um, which systems sort of meet that definition and what information should be relayed to the public, but also tougher <coughs> questions like how should you be storing the technical information about these systems? What should the legal standard be if an individual or community is disproportionately harmed by the use of a system? So um, with that work, so this is where it's going to get a little weird on the timeline. So, because <laughs> part of this work I started um, while I was still at the ACLU, and that was during the legislative process. But pretty much once the bill became a law, um, we convened a group of researchers and advocates from all sorts of areas. Um, because New York is fairly unique in that we have all of these great institutions here, so we do have a great <coughs> resource base for um, researchers and people who are doing great work in areas that are important. 
And so we brought them together to kind of try to figure out how can we influence this process from the outside or help it move along so that way the right decisions can be made in New York and even if they're not, it can serve as a roadmap or some examples for people in other jurisdictions because these are not New York specific issues, but they're issues that are being dealt with by governments globally and nationally. So um, in that process, we've written several letters to both the mayor and the task force chairs offering sort of recommendations on the process, but also trying to do that recentering of who um, becomes part of the conversation, so recommending both organizations and individuals who should be consulted throughout the process. And part of that thinking is because I've done a lot of work in government, so I know the easiest approach is often what's taken, so that's going to grass tops groups or whoever someone already knows, which is not necessarily the voices that need to be part of that conversation. So it's more of here, handing information to government, but also sharing information so other advocates in other localities can see what we're doing. And I don't necessarily think what we're doing needs to be modeled, but at least it's showing some ideas to help move the conversation along so others can figure out what to do in their local context. Um, right now, the process is about a year in um, to its, the task force is about a year in. I'm looking yep. at Vincent because he's on it. Um, but the uh, task force is due to release a report at the end of the year and pretty much the most immediate thing that we've been doing right now is they're about to have two public um, forums to solicit input from the public. So a lot of my work has been doing outreach to groups that have not been very visible, but I think they have a vested interest in these issues. So um, some of the work we did was creating a chart about known uses so that way organizations could assess what issues were important to them. I've also done work with um, attorneys at direct legal services so we could actually have people who are affected by these systems showing up to speak about what they think um, and doing some calls with like tenant groups and other organizations so that way people understand the different legal issues and can also bring their lived experience to that. And then the other piece that we are trying to draw from this experience is trying to identify where there's gaps in resources to help build capacity because I think a lot of the time technical issues are people fray from them because it's like, ooh, math. But a lot of the times it's just that things need to be explained properly. So um, we did put out a toolkit last year that would help um, demystify some of the terms and help bring some information that is being uncovered in research in layman's terms so everyone can sort of have equal access to information. And that's something we're going to continue to build on because in order for people to feel comfortable enough to engage, I think there just needs to be a little bit extra work from the research side to help build capacity so we're all at least familiar with the different languages that we're using because often terms have different understandings and that leads to some tension in this work. So trying to use our position to help others and sort of broaden the conversation so we can at least have a better understanding of like what's at stake. I don't think any one opinion is going to be right on these issues because we're, it's as technologies evolve, we're trying to figure out things as they're happening, but I do think having more voices at the table will help us do a better assessment of what the problem is and what the best decision given those risks are. And I'll stop there. Great. Thank you, Rashida. I, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna, and I should have said, just to give you all a roadmap of where we're going, I'm gonna, I, we'll hear from Sharon, we'll hear from Hamid, and then we'll have a little bit of a conversation, and I'll open the floor up to you for, for questions from, from the audience as well. Um, so while Sharon's waiting to get set up. Great, thanks. Thanks so much, Brian. Great. Good morning, thank you. Um, thanks, I, I wanna to apologize to the speakers from yesterday afternoon, because I teach on Wednesday afternoon, so I'm really looking forward to the video replay. Um, but the, uh, the terrific uh, discussion that was in the morning yesterday, I, I hope and I think many of you will hear um, the many resonances of how your comments and insights are inflected today. I think it really, um, I wanted to pick up on some of them. Because I have limited time, I won't be able to do it specifically. So, um, whoever controls the cloud controls the future. This was said by Wang Chen, who was the head of the propaganda office of the State uh, Council Information Office. He said this in 2010. 
And this is before, you know, Xi Jinping announced this is the new battlefield. So this is really all the terminology. We've actually translated the uh, whole report, uh, the unedited version first, so you can see that on our website. Um, this vision, broader than China's AI vision, is China's vision is to lead the world. They're going to be the lead, and they have a short term, 2030, and they're playing the long game, which is 2050. And they're going to lead the world in AI, in the theories, technologies, and applications, and that includes quantum, 5G, and mass data storage, mining, everything. And this is through hardware, software, database, the whole nine yards. Um, <clears throat> specifically for today, some of the um, um, digital technologies that are implicated in some of the issues that I'm raising um, has to do with biometrics, identification systems, and AI-enabled tools like facial recognition. Some of them have gait recognition, like we all are supposed to have a particular gait, the way we walk, and that recognizes. Um, urban um, transport management system, that's a fancy way for saying policing. Um, so these are also enabled by huge Chinese IT companies that are either state-owned enterprises or invested uh, with huge investment from the government. You know some of them, Huawei, very much in the media. Um, Alibaba, Tencent, uh, Tencent. Tencent. Um, they are step shaping the whole global infrastructure. So it's not what happens in China doesn't stay in China. And there's a rather slow uptake, but speeding up in the international community that these activities, these actors, and China's vision and policy presents risks to the world because this is a comprehensive policy. So I'm just going to show you some very quick <coughs> pictures of um, what the media has been presenting, the Western media, and this is what I think is the dominant image of what is, you know, digitally enhanced authoritarianism. Like, what does it really look like and what is happening? And this is kind of what some of the pictures you've seen. Facial recognition software by a company. Um, this is the technology. This is all quite public because it's all out in the media now. Um, this is, you've probably seen this picture. This is the object detention, uh, detection and tracking technology. Um, they exhibited this in an AI exhibition in Tokyo in last year. So, you know, you see, you know, it tells what's happening. You see, you know, it's, it's like doing this very minority report, future looking type, you know, Orwellian world. Um, this is at the Beijing office of uh, uh, Megvi. This is a company, and this shows like people being identified by these numbers. This is a supposedly cool, but not cool, you know, image of the police. And they're wearing this uh, web camera type uh, glasses, yeah? Okay, so one thing that's not clear about all of this is the extent to which it's live time data and the extent to which um, it's automated decision making. They're clearly using AI-enabled technology, but we're not sure because it's a pretty fast-moving technological landscape. Social credit system. There's a lot of media about this being uh, used. But social credit system didn't jump out now. Actually, one of the students in my seminar here is doing a whole uh, paper on looking at the antecedents to the social credit system, the hukou system, the dang'an, the case file system, you know, before it was digitalized, right? So the social credit system, I want to say two quick things about the social credit system. Um, it really was way back in 2004, 2005, 2006, but in 2014, um, the state council um, announced a plan, and the plan was the social credit system plan. And that was a roadmap. It was, all of it was mapped out for a comprehensive social credit mega system. And this would be rolled out, hopefully, by 2020 with stages. There were three stages, and it was going to go into 2030. But it's built on this notion of trust. Um, some very excellent scholarship has called this moving from rule of <coughs> law, R-O-L, to rule of trust, which appropriately is named, like you can say the acronym is ROT. So you're going from rule of law to ROT. Yes. So there, um, this system is comprehensive, and it's governing four main areas. It's governing all of the, um, uh, the governance, the society, business, all the sector. It is comprehensive, all members of society. And how are they doing it? Through four mechanisms. Info gathering, info sharing, labeling, and 
joint sanctions. So across the government agencies, they're sharing the info that they have collecting on you, and the sanctions you get will be joint. You can be sanctioned by all the different. So how is the main thing you've heard? There's blacklists and there are red lists. Blacklists are those who have broken trust, right? They have seen. The red lists are the people who have kept trust. And so it's weird in English, it's sort of weird in Chinese too, trust keeping list. So you're on the blacklist, you're on your red list. And while you see this list, there are commercial credit systems, there's Sesame Credit, which is really a comprehensive system on like finance credit. Then there's Tencent Credit, there's government pilots in like seven different pilots. And um, it's not one system yet. What it will all do is converge. That's what will happen. It will become a, uh, a nationalized uh, major uh, database system. But this is interesting. This was a survey that was done uh, by, uh, on, in 2018, last year. And when you look at this, they're asking the netizens, do you participate in a social credit system? And you see how almost a big percentage is are in the, the commercial credit systems. And then eight people who don't even, I mean eight percent, who don't even know. That means they might be part of a credit system that's collecting information on them, sharing the information, labeling them as trust breakers or trust keepers. They don't know. So this is, um, why this I wanted to show. So what do people think in China about this building that the Western media is showing as this big, big digital uh, authoritarianism? You won't be able to see it closely, but let me just point out that what you see are real differences, even in this limited survey, education background, geography. You see whether they're rural, whether they're age group, you see different levels. And one of the things I notice is if you look at the red, that little tiny sliver in the red, they're the ones who are the strongly disagree. That is, they strongly disagree with the approval of the system. That seems to be on this end of high education. So there's a disparity. And so it's important when you hear the dominant narrative, Chinese people like the social credit system. We go, really? Which ones? You know, who? What are the subgroups? So, the AI that's the topic of today's discussion of this panel is not isolated. It is part of this whole ecosystem of control. And you see AI as part of technology. It's a small part, actually, but it's a powerful part. And all of the system of law, ideology, social norms, and the technology, all are comprehensive, interrelated, and work together to maintain a system of control. And so this, you see the social credit system is really part of changing and enforcing social norms. I didn't put in here Xi Jinping thought, which is now in the Chinese constitution, the state constitution, and in the party constitution. That means Xi Jinping thought shapes what you can think, what you can express. That's why there's huge ideological education campaigns going on in China, in the schools, for the courts, for the lawyers, for the journalists, it's in the law. They take ideological training. So law, which I'm not gonna talk about all of these, but you can ask about it, uh, are, are basically the main bodies of laws that have been promulgated in the last few years have securitized the whole body of law. In other words, it's together, views every single person, every single activity, every single area, including cyberspace, the ocean, and space space, yeah? as a potential source of risk. All of everything all around the one party state views everything else in the universe, literally, as a potential risk. It's defined in the law that way, and all of the implementing regulations, in particular carrying out cybersecurity, in fact, are uh, regulating actors, content, dissemination, storage, requiring local data storage, and putting out very specific technology requirements for the ISP providers, for the hardware providers, for the software developers, so it's one system. This is because we're in NYU Law School, so I should say something about law a little bit more. So Chinese um, uh, have been using what I call an intentional mistranslation when they speak in the international arena. So they'll say something else in Chinese, but somehow it always gets translated as 
rule of law. So that contributes to the feeling that we're all sleeping in the different beds, but we're dreaming the same dream. So no matter what we're doing, we're all dreaming about rule of law. And then there was some debate, no, it's really ruled by law, or it's ruled by man, and we mean man. But now, what's happened is it's unmasked. Xi Jinping and the party state says, oh, let me be really clear. We do not mean rule of law. We do not mean independent courts. They said this specifically. They said, what we mean is to govern the country according to law, or rule the country by law. And this is the first thing to start thinking about when you think about democracy, rule of law, protection of rights. They're saying, no, we don't believe in that. That's not our vision. It's not what we're trying to do. Okay. And this was just emphasized in January by this new regulation of, on the Communist Party. And what that emphasizes is the party is supreme. All the actors in the legal system, judges, procuracy, public security, national security, everyone is under the leadership of the party. OK, so that sounds pretty terrible. So I'm going to talk about the challenges this presents to the democratization of data. or. How, what are the challenges in a system which is operating under the Chinese model of democracy? Because that's what the Chinese leadership is saying, that the West has shown that democracy failed, that the Western liberal democracy model is a failure. Exhibit A is Trump. They point to Trump and say, yeah, 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 direct election, look what you produced, that. Now, in some way, this is the one place I do agree with the Communist Party. I mean, this is really scary, but I do agree with Xi Jinping that this is like really bad news, you know? So um, I want to look at some of these specific challenges that's posed. It's first this vision. It's the community of, sh it's the shared future of mankind. But what does it mean? It sounds pretty good. We're all in it, you know? No more global nor north, you know, oppressing the global south. And, you know, they, they, they use that. And they say, we're going to lead the world, the global south, to take our rightful place. What that really means is China is going to take its rightful place at the center of the universe again, leading as the global leader. That's why you see regional global leadership. And uh, OBAR is one belt, one road. Um, these are the models that China is actively promoting, actively promoting. Chinese model of development, uh, in case you want to know, it means no rights-based development, which is the dominant model. Human rights with Chinese characteristics, it's an oxymoron, that means no human rights. Chinese democracy model, it means no democracy, because the democracy under the party is basically no democracy. The third way that there, um, these challenges pose is Chinese narrative concepts and terms. They're using existing terms, and they're manipulating it. So like uh, information security is an existing term. That means protect your information from hacking. No, what they mean is information security of good content, not bad content, like subversive content. OK, <clears throat> these are some of the challenges. There's more, but you know we don't have enough time to talk about all of them. But who are the affected communities, right? because we talk about affected communities. So who are they? First of all, the first thing I want to suggest is the affected communities in China is everybody, particularly those online. Right now, over 859 million people. That is more than double the population of the United States. So the affected communities, by all of this digitally enhanced surveillance control, in China is 1.4 billion people, but very specifically 859 online and all of the offline communities because this censorship online bleeds through to the um, uh, line, to the uh, offline online space is intimately related. Then there are specific groups. Okay, what kind of specific groups? Ethnic groups, Tibetans, Uyghurs, particularly ethnic Uyghur Muslim groups, ethnic Kazakh Muslims, and here you see, this is a promotion. This is a marketing uh, page that's been translated into English. And this is to show how their technology will help you identify sensitive groups, sensitive people. How will you know? And they show pictures. Sensitive groups from the um, data platforms like what? Like Tibetans and Uyghurs. They specifically say that the purpose of this surveillance technology is to identify, track, and monitor these sensitive groups. Well, what happens to these sensitive groups? Well, this is kind of my last three stories of, you could say, resisting authoritarianism. 
Okay, these are, you don't need to read all of them, but these are the red flags. So some ways, resistance doesn't mean like going like this. Resistance could mean praying. This is what, this is what gets you into the detention camp. Fasting, because it's, it's, uh, it's during Ramadan. Um, wearing a beard, you know? Um, wearing a shirt that has Arabic writing on it, right? Look at, look at these. Um, um, not attending mandatory flag-raising ceremonies. Anyway, it goes on and on. Performing a traditional funeral. Doing any of these things, which is a religious cultural right. Telling, trying to speak Tibetan. Teaching children Tibetan. Young people going into mosques. These are all not only exercises of protected rights, they're actually acts of resistance as well. But what does that get you? So these camps, which have suddenly garnered the attention of the international community, belatedly, the reported numbers are 800,000 Uyghur, Cossacks, and other ethnic groups in the camps to a high of almost 2 million in these camps. And in these camps, there's another one picture. So one thing, Google Earth has some good uses. So someone found these and then posted these. And this is in the face of Chinese government, when confronted with the camp, <clears throat> first denied the camps. Secondly, they said, OK, they exist, but they're not detention camps. People can come and go, notwithstanding the barbed wire and everything else. These are professional re-education camps. And in the face of the denial, a little bit of tech, like Google Earth, can go a big way to challenge a big lie. So that's one thing that's really important. The second thing about the camps that's important about resistance is the role and importance of the diaspora community, in particular the Uyghur community in North America and in Europe. They're the ones who are collecting the stories. There was a lot of talk yesterday about collecting narratives, having their own voices. Where is that coming from? It's not coming from Xinhua, Chinese. It's coming from the relatives and friends and people who care. They're getting the stories out. But even trying to tell someone your story will get you into a camp. That's the first thing that will get you into the camp. So that's why one of our friends, Dokin Issa, a Uyghur student <coughs> activist, mother, 84-something-year-old mother, was in the camps. And nobody could tell him in the family that his, their mother was in the camp. Because if they called him, they would go into the camps. When she died in the camps, he, could, he didn't even know until months, months later. Because no one could tell him. So this is, some tech can be helpful to, to counter a big lie. The diaspora community and the international community has a role to play. We need to hear what's happening, demand to know what's happening, and we need to respond. This is my second story, and this is Huang Qi. And he's, when you see the sign he's making, you'll say, how, how, how is he continuing? Huang Qi is a, um, a, a software engineer, database builder. And when the military crackdown occurred, the big one in 1989, Huang Qi built a missing persons database, and he collected data so that people could find their family members because their bodies were either burnt, disappeared, or just no one ever knew what happened to their children or their loved ones. So he built this database, and he was, in 1999, this base launched. And then he was arrested, and he was charged and convicted with um, uh, voicing grievances and crying out for the democracy movement. This was like what, you know, and other charges. Detained, released, comes back out, builds another website in 2005 later. That was a Tian, um, the Tian Wang Human Rights Center. Then he's published, he's detained. Then he builds another website after the infamous Sichuan earthquake in 2008 where children were killed due to corruption in these Dofu schools. So he built a website for that, publicizing the plight of the families. In any case, he served another three years in prison and was released in 2011. He has chronic renal failure due to the health and the abuse he suffered in prison. And in 2016, he was arrested again on suspicion of illegally providing state secrets abroad. What are those state secrets? The information, et cetera, that he's collected. His mother has been heroically, courageously, persistently raising her son's case, saying, he is innocent, he's doing what any human being should be doing in this situation. And um, he, she disappeared, and then she has you know, resurfaced later um, in January. So here is somebody who's using the tech, who's resisting, and he's paying the full price, his freedom, his health, and 
hopefully not his life. The last um, story is this is uh, this year, 2019, is the 30th anniversary of the military crackdown on unarmed civilians in 1989. That happened before the full view of the whole world. Anyone watching TV on June 4th, 1989, saw the tanks roll over. People, people getting shot in the back, saw people running in terror. We saw it, we witnessed it. But what happened was, kind of like not just in China, but here, the leadership said, you gonna believe me, or you gonna believe your eyes? And what they were saying is, you're gonna believe me. And so what's followed for three decades is enforced amnesia. So you have a generation that doesn't believe it happened. They think it's the Western world made it up kind of thing. Yeah. But this is um, the way that the Tiananmen Mothers, a group of, uh, of family members and, and of the people killed, the students, the labor activists, citizens going to work who got caught in all of the chaos, you know, ordinary citizens, a cook, uh, you know, all uh, kinds of people. We have their stories on our website. But this is from their um, uh, statement this year. We've been translating for decades. Every year they do a statement. This year is really powerful. And my colleagues sitting here uh, have copies if people want them. But this is how they define themselves, claiming the right to name. Who are we? And they said, we're a group of citizens. We're citizens who lost our loved ones. We are the guardians of the souls of the June 4th martyrs. We are the staunch guardians of hope. So can you imagine, after 30 years, they're still raising their demands, which is for truth and accounting, accountability, and compensation and apology. Some of them have committed suicide. Another one had died because Xi Jinping's strategy is die. Let them die out because they're, a lot of them are in their 80s, very frail. So this is the year. We must not say, oh, it happened thir three year 30 years ago. This is the year that we have to critically acknowledge what happened and support you know, these voices. This is um, uh, our website, and uh, this is the parents holding a picture of their child who was killed. And um, Ding Zilin, who was for the bulk of this time, was the major spokesperson. She told me, she said, um, as long as I have a living breath to my dying breath, I want justice for my son. And we're building a sub-site uh, with a lot of photos, and we're going to feature the stories of them so they don't just die without a face, without a story, and each one has a story, what happened, what they did, what their lives were, and um, so we're trying to keep that memory, but also to mobilize um, action. Um, some of the stuff that I went very fast on, the surveillance tech, we have a report that we gave, uh, submitted to the UN on surveillance technology, so I know I was like uh, talking a little too fast on that. So we have copies of that, and they're also up here uh, if people want, so I will leave it at that. Thanks so much, Sharon. So we're going to hear from Hamid. Switch spots. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Sometimes you don't need mics because out on the street you're just mobilizing and rallying and, and organizing. So thank you very much. Thanks for the invite. It's really nice to be here, see some, uh, some of uh, my family, community folks here, people that I love building with, people I really just, the work that, honoring their work. Tawana Petty set the tone yesterday, an inspiration for all of us, Sita Gangadharan is doing amazing research and organizing Jackie Zamudo, who's just uh, this whole example of witness and documenting abuse um, has been something that is a model for all of us. So um, again, I'm from Los Angeles. I'm with a group called the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. Uh, my own personal history uh, has been, I'm an immigrant from Pakistan. I was born and raised in Pakistan. I went to school in Pakistan. I don't have any formal education in the US. Didn't go to school here. I have a BA uh, from Lahore, which I ended up cheating on my finals because uh, that's, I needed some artificial intelligence. Uh, just to pass through some of the courses that they were teaching us. But as I was listening to the talk, I was thinking about facial recognition and how do we, and which kind of sets the tone 
uh, for me to lift the voices from LA and honor the work of so many people who just completely volunteer their, their time and dedicate their life to the coalition. Uh, and I also want to honor my fellow Soros fellows as well. Uh, Jody was here yesterday and Latanya is gonna be here, so I'm a 2010 fellow myself, um, going back several years. Um, and I was thinking of facial recognition, that what does it really even mean to us? And I think that sets the tone of how do we build our narrative, how do we debunk certain things, and how do we root it in the system of white supremacy? Because the white supremacist gaze has always been a facial recognition system. It didn't need technology. It didn't need to identify that who is and what is a threat to the white supremacist plantation capitalism. So I think that's our building block and that's where we come from. Um, so the story of the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition, and I'm just gonna, uh, rather than going too much into, into content, I wanna talk about the, the, that how do we build a culture of resistance? How do we build power on the ground? How do we build people's power against a system, and particularly when we speak about surveillance, where most of the space had been occupied by you know, just uh, very much uh, uh, spaces of white privilege, institutional privilege, and knowledge colonization as well. For example, going back to COINTELPRO and going back to various fights, I mean, these fights were very limited in scope to these institutions like nonprofit law firms like the ACLU, where the community was never involved. They look at the Constitution, look at the violation of the Constitution. But for us and many of my, my folks in Skid Row, that's where we are based out, our, our primary members are unhoused people and several other folks who are, are fighting the system, formerly incarcerated, uh, undocumented immigrants, queer trans folks, uh, artists, people living on the, on the margins supposedly, uh, they, their voices were never heard. So that was the founding principle of the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition. Uh, that everything that we are looking at is not a moment in time, but a continuation of history. This has been going on forever. I mean, we are in New York, and I'll talk about some of the, some of the things as well, that, uh, that what is the history of New York City and New York itself. Uh, the second principle, that there's always the creation of the other. The enemy is always there, and we, we talk about the, the shifting faces within the cultural, political, economic, and structural realm of, of society and the systems as well. The face of the savage native, the face of the criminal black, the face of the illegal Latino, the face of the manipulative Asian, the face of the terrorist Muslim, the face of the, the deviant trans, femme identified bodies. So it's also an opportunity that when we look at the others, there are way more others to be still organizing. So there's a lot of power in that others as well, right? So just how do we claim power? And when we, are, and when we talk about surveillance, the goal always is to build power and not paranoia. That is something that we build as well together. Uh, the third uh, principle is to desensationalize the rhetoric of national security because it's always been an issue of national security that the, the, the anarchists are here, the communists are here, the black rebellions are coming, the Muslim terrorist is here. So how do we bring it home? And that's why it was really critical, my own personal history in organizing in, in, in the U.S. Uh, going back to the late 80s and then being part of a startup organization in 1990 of the South Asian Network in L.A., uh, looking at the impact on the South Asian community, but also looking at gender violence in the community, looking at child sexual abuse, looking at homophobia, uh, and looking at deep, deep, deep anti-blackness within, within our communities as well. And uh, we sort of say that, that, you know, that there is that communities which are non-white, non-black, uh, there is a, a disease that we suffer from, and that is the assumption of privilege of not being black. So I think the anti-blackness piece needs to be really lifted and directly taken head on so those become our organizing principles. So how do we desensationalize this thing? Then our fight is anchored in human rights, that yes, constitutional rights, but as my, my, my dear, dear comrade, General Dogon would say, who the city of LA is trying to get on a third strike just for being a human rights defender and organizing on the street, uh, and we've been talking about writing about it, that how the constitution itself is a blueprint for oppression. So we can't be seeking remedies through the Constitution. And I know in a law school here, it may seem like, you know, sh well, sh oh, shut it down then. So our fight's on the streets. So that's how we've been building uh, uh, the, um, our power in Los Angeles. Uh, so just a little bit about the history of surveillance and not a moment in time. So the very first thing is lantern laws. How many people have heard of lantern laws? 
This was something out of New York City. This was something that uh, Simone Brown uh, has written quite extensively in her book, uh, Dark Matters, Surveillance of During the Times of Slavery. And this was something in New York City in the early 1700s that if you were an enslaved body and if you were not accompanied by a master, you had to walk with a lantern to self-identify yourself as a threat, right? So facial recognition takes on several uh, uh, shapes and several forms as well. And then, of course, slave patrols, which, again, as abolitionists, it is critical that we root our, our understanding of law enforcement, that no, it is not about public safety. Tawana Petty reminded us yesterday about how do we think of the difference between security and safety, and what does it mean? These have always been forces which have been created, and we see it very, say it very clearly, that the function of police in the United States is the intent to cause harm. So that's why they need to be abolished. So when we talk about abolition, it's not some kissy poo foo foo thing that you know just like they are there for public safety. They're very directly there to cause harm to subsets of population where there's direct stalking, there's direct targeting, there's direct murders. And I come from LA, where LAPD over the last 10 years, supposedly the model um, uh, since the consent decree, has murdered the most people of any police department in the country. Even this year, the officer involved shooting top any other agency in the country. So this is what we are looking at when we talk about these things. And of course, there's a whole piece. Um, and uh, you know, talking about surveillance, want to bring it down to a local level. A lot of times, surveillance conversation begins with COINTELPRO, with the FBI, with the feds. But the Red Squads, which started out of Chicago in the 1880s, just were preceded. Uh, uh, coin to El Pro by at least about 50 years, and May Day is coming. So the history of the Red Squads is that Haymarket st strike happened. People familiar with the Haymarket strike, 1886, eight-hour workday, the fight that was going on. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, people were, 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 were hung as a result of that, uh, which resulted in, uh, uh, in, the, in the creation of the International Workers' Solidarity Day, which we call May Day. That was a direct uh, outcome of Haymarket strikes. But by 1888, uh, Chicago Police Department had formed these covert operations known as the Red Squads. And then, of course, the rest is history, going to Philadelphia, to New York, to Los Angeles. And what was interesting was that as we did uh, more and more research around the Red Squads, that in LA, the Red Squads were based out of the Chambers of Commerce. Imagine that. And then over 80% of their budget and money came from the Manufacturers Association, the Retailers Association, and of course, the organizing on the ports and everything else. So just wanted to share this, that how throughout time that when we talk about a moment in time that it's not, it didn't happen post 9-11, it didn't happen post 1996 laws, it didn't happen with the Clinton's crime bill. These were all, so when we talk about Trump today, the playbook has always been there. Obama was the, was the deportee in chief. I mean, he was known as deportee in chief, and of course, like, you know, within the advocacy world, and the foundations wouldn't let people speak about it because the NPIC is very complicit in this thing the nonprofit industrial complex, and how we speak about these things. So, so just wanted to, uh, to share some of the history. This was uh, what we mapped out, and when I say we, it is a whole lot of people. It's Jamie Garcia, it's Mariela Saba, it is Nadia Khan, it's Jyoti Chan, it's General Dogon, it's Eddie H, it's Craig Roberts. I mean, dozens and dozens of people involved in doing grassroots community-based research to identify that how does the LAPD, and focusing on LAPD, keeping our work very local, what is their architectural surveillance? What is the intersection of human-based surveillance? What is the intersection of technology-based surveillance? But then reshaping that, that technology is not just like, you know, this is not just technology, but how we, what, what does it mean to speak about these things, to really just kind of, how, how is the impact taking place? So SAR, Suspicious Activity Reporting, I watch, see something, say something, uh, very clearly predictive policing, uh, the intelligence gathering guidelines, trap bar, I have photos too, but this is on our website, I don't have time for that. But we can, at some point, like, you know, just please go to the website, stoplapdspying.org, and you can look at pictures as well. Unfortunately, we gotta take down two photos because we don't have any resources or capacity, but Ajahn France out of uh, Canada wrote to us and they said that you poached two of our pictures, and we're like, look, we're just using it for community education, and we had to raise money to send them a check for $189 and then we have to take two of those photos. So if you have photos of trap wire, Jackie, please send it to us. <laughs> so uh, some of these, so it's, it's, uh, well, that's, that's how it is, so. Now this is something that we have been working on, 
And this is what we call the information sharing environment and the stalker state. And what you're looking at is that centering it in the LAPD architecture of surveillance, that how does information move within various systems? So how are we traced? How are we tracked? How are we monitored? How information moves from public sector to private sector to the corporate mafia to social media to this, that, and the other. So this is where, so in a sense, I think this is what brings me back to, to uh, something that I was, I was share that as we were building this campaign, as we were building the coalition, the conversations became really critical. And now it's interesting that, that out there, this, this conversation about dirty data is being lifted. But you know, for us, it was always very critical that my face is a dirty data. But when we talk about white supremacy, the black body represents dirty data. The indigenous body represents dirty data. You know, the immigrant body represents dirty data. So I don't need to be reminded that where is dirty data because we walk into it to fighting dirty data. So when people say that it's dirty data and we need to be transparent and we need to be accountable, that is really a failure of imagination. That is a failure of imagination where we get into dirty data rather than saying abolish it. End this fucking thing right now. Sorry for the cussing. So, the young brain. <laughs> so I'm just the organizer in me just comes out once in a while. So the question is then what is that cultural resistance that we are building? Because if we know that no, it is not about invasion of privacy because that was the other piece that we, we debunked. That privacy is a very white privileged space. My body has never had any privacy. Our community in Skid Row have never had any privacy. Right? So I don't need to be told that it's an invasion of privacy. I need to be told that, look, this is, this is the shit that's going on and let's build power and let's just end it and let's abolish it. And I really appreciate Sita lifting abolition yesterday because unless we really root ourselves in abolition, unless we really just define our work through the lens of abolition, then we are going around in circles. Then it's very much now, and, and I was telling somebody yesterday that I'm having a CIR moment these days, which is a comprehensive immigration reform movement. And I was involved in the immigrant, and been involved in the immigrant rights movement post-1986. And what happened was that the foundations came in, and there was this one assessment by the mid-2000s that over $200 million had been sunk by the foundations in the immigrant rights movement. And then the best thing we got for was comprehensive immigration reform, which instead of that became a comprehensive enforcement regime, when you really look at the mechanics of that. So we are in that moment in surveillance, and which is now this sort of you know, economies of scale and subsets of economies are being created around surveillance as well, where corporations are moving in, corporations are taking control of our work as well. The, the foundations are pouring millions and millions of dollars and monies are going in, and full disclosure, because as abolitionists, because the work that we do, the largest grant we got was $7,000. I was speaking to folks at OSF about this piece and they said, oh, this is too overwhelming for us. Well, of course it's overwhelming. You better be overwhelmed. You better, your life better be disrupted, right? So the, so the thing is that it is really up to us. I mean, we are the ones that we've been waiting for, as our elders have always said. So this is how, so I wanted to share this because this is really crucial. This is how things are going. This is where our, our, our battle is. And hopefully, I also have a pitch that because we need help. We don't, have, we don't have paid researchers. All of this work has been done by volunteers. We need support. We are at, at, this, at this campus. We are at NYU Corporation. We did. So if, if you're going to donate time, we need students to research this thing. We need to create this and digitize this and use them as a tool of empowerment, as a tool for awareness raising, as a tool for organizing to build power for people to understand. Because one of the projects that we have among a partnership with folks in Detroit and Charlotte is our data bodies that what is the intersection and how our body moves. And, then, and, and yesterday, I believe it was Tawana or Sita lifted what's in your wallet. Well, what's in your wallet is also how's your body moving through and where is your body going, right? So it's, it's, it's an all-encompassing process that what is our fight? Um, and this is just an example of breaking down a few things. So for example, this is the, the stalker state. So we, we got a couple students who started researching that, okay, what is the information sharing looking like? This is an example of DMV. So when people talk about sanctuary cities and talking about ICE having access to information, information moves in multiple levels. It is extremely multi-layered. 
right? And then when you talk about national security exemptions, when you talk about law enforcement and, uh, investigative exemptions, this is where the information moves because this is why understanding of the stalker state that unoverwhelm it or underwhelm it is critical to know that what is our fight? What is our defense? What is our collective defense? How do we then, then equip ourselves and our communities, the term may be pro per, to, to, to advocate for themselves? And when somebody goes for their food stamps renewal and your caseworker is saying that why did you use food stamps in Riverside County instead of LA County? Well, how the heck did they find out? Okay, but now you start, eligibility becomes an issue. Or how does a caseworker find out that you went shopping uh, at, at a corner store? These are stories that have been shared with us, right, by people who have been researching this thing. So what is our fight? How do we stop this thing from happening? Because it's an extremely traumatizing and an extremely dehumanizing thing. And I think I would also say that about dirty data conversation too, that when I hear, it's almost re-traumatizing that I know that, I am dirty data. So I don't need to be reminded about that. So I think we need to be really looking at harm and trauma that is caused. This is another piece that we broke down on housing and urban development and housing. How are people's Section 8 vouchers being impacted? How some relative in Detroit is doing something and it impacts somebody's Section 8 vouchers in LA? That's the stalker state. That is the intentional with the intent to cause harm. Health and human services, how HIPAA uh, gets overruled because of national security exemptions, because of law enforcement investigations. So just wanted to give you an example as to, you know, how do we understand our fight. Uh, just, uh, so this is something that um, was critical because we have several working groups as well. One of the working group at the coalition is that, that's really debunking this notion of community policing and looking at it through the lens of counterinsurgency. Oh, no, yes, I'm not. oh, okay. Looking at it through the lens of counterinsurgency, because counterinsurgency is community policing is an, a, an extension of counterinsurgency. This is something that has always been used, but we need to challenge the language of community policing, or as Clinton would say, community-oriented policing, or various ways of talking about it. So there's another one that is debunking this notion that data can set us free, because it can't. And going back to the stalker state, the data is so, it, it is something that it is a virus unless we find, find morning, wake up and hit the delete button and have a complete clean slate, data cannot set us free, right? So the, so the challenge is that rather than, you know, having regulations and uh, the fight for regulatory oversight and transparency, the fight has to be about abolition and the reduction. So this is what, in, in, in our journey towards abolition, what would harm reduction look like? What is ultimately we're looking at harm elimination, but what would harm reduction look like? So when we talk about algorithms, and this is something that uh, just to, to share with you all, that we had been in a six year fight against the LAPD's predictive policing program. And I'm very, very happy to announce that last Tuesday on April 9th, we dismantled their laser program. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And we, we dismantled uh, their chronic offender bulletin program. You may have heard about heat lists and all of that stuff. So they just, they basically announced, and this was something, not a zero, not a single meeting with the cops. The hell with the chief of the police. We ain't, we don't got a time to go meet with you. You want to meet with us, come to the community hall and meet with the larger community. There is no backdoor negotiation. Not a single visit to the city council members. Like this was sheer people power. And, I, and the person who le leads it, and this is where community power comes in, I want to honor Jamie Garcia, who's a full-time nurse, who's a full-time nurse in Boyle Heights, is, is, is serving the community on the east side of Los Angeles, knows and is frustrated, but just rather than you know, getting paranoid and frustrated, built that power and said, I'll lead this campaign and led the campaign with a lot of power, with the support of a lot of. So when we talk about algorithm, we have to look at the whole, and this is Jamie's uh, uh, creation as well that we have to look at the ecology of algorithm, how the algorithms are. So when we talk about bail reform, when we talk about risk assessment tools, when we talk about you know, just various other tools, we also have to understand that how these tools are being informed and guided and what it means to us. Um, I just want to share quickly that this is all our grassroots research. This is something that has been done by the people. Uh, from the people written by that. We have a whole process of, of public records uh, training which are done by the people, not a single lawyer involved because for us, filing for public records and FOIA is not about litigation. That's not the point of entry. It's about storytelling. That how do we build that story and what we want to know. 
So rather than the first document would be not just their operational guidelines, but what was the grant proposal you sent to the National Institute of Justice? What, was the grant, what, what were you thinking in your grant proposal that gave us half a million dollars to create a predictive policing program? Because we know what you think, we want to know how you're, how you're thinking about it. What is the intellectual framework behind it? And then, of course, uh, Jeffrey Branthingham shows up, the guy who's a professor of anthropology at UCLA. He right? was the chair of anthropology at UCLA. And so what we did in this fight of predictive policing, we started organizing, at UCLA, we started organizing on UCLA campus. And then in this fight up to April 9th, 28 faculty members from UCLA and 40 graduate students from UCLA signed a letter against Jeff Branthingham and saying that, and, and questioning the ethics and merit of their colleagues' research. Now it's one of those very rare things that in your campus organizing. So I'm trying to kind of just lift this thing that what does grassroots organizing look like and what is community power building. So this was one of our first reports about suspicious activity reporting program. Um, this is about the body cameras. This was released in the end of 2014. Very clear uh, uh, assessment that we completely reject the notion of body cameras. Body cameras are a 24 hour tool of surveillance and now it's coming out because body cameras, instead of officer misconduct, most of the time it's about dealing with and, the, and reducing liability over the department. Because body cameras become more of a justification to, to commit murders of our people and to show and that's where body cameras are coming in. This was our fight against the drones. This was a drone report that was, the community did that. The graphic is done by a community member as well. We were able to uh, keep the LAPD drones grounded for three and a half years. So, so that happened as well. Uh, now they're in a pilot project, so we're going up for a fight. And this was our most recent report from May 2018, uh, before the bullet hits the body dismantling predictive policing in Los Angeles. And it was very crucial, and we had long conversations about the title, but it had to be very clear and very direct, that what is the trajectory of that point of contact and escalation before, within two seconds, the, the, the gun comes out and a bullet is fired, right? So what is going on, and what are the conditions on the ground that are created? How escalating use of force is being justified? How Supreme Court decisions from Indiana back in 2000 are used about walking into a high threat environment? What does it mean to, to, to define behavioral surveillance and suspicious activity as observed behavior reasonably indicative of pre-operational planning? What the heck does that mean? But that is, these are legitimate you know, definitions of suspicious activity as well. So it really was critical that how do we build this and very much rooted in the community, very much rooted or written by the community as well, including over uh, uh, a dozen or so focus groups, 300 surveys, and people just kind of just and sharing the assessment of surveys within the community as well and people coming back with their understanding and their answers as well. Here's an example of now our work is really lifting the issue of land that it is predictive policing just like broken windows was about land, predictive policing is about land as well. Just like weed and seed was about land, predictive policing is about land as well. And this is what is going on. So these were through our public records, and by the way, we're in the middle of a public records lawsuit against the LAPD as well. Uh, we filed in, in, in February of last year, and then we go to trial because we want them to release all the lists of individuals in the chronic offender bulletin. And our argument is that people need to know that they're in this list and they should have a right for claim and reparation as well if their rights have been violated, right? So among those, we got these hotspots. So hotspots in predictive policing, they mark these 500 by 500 square foot looking at the historic crime data and current crime data. But when you look at it, um, I'm gonna have to come up over here to show you that you would have thought, so this is a central division that oversees Skid Row. This is Little Tokyo. 
This is the art district, and this is the way out. So that's how, when we talk about land and we talk about banishment, it becomes really crucial that we need to kind of lift these things because it's not about public safety. It's, it's really about banishment of land. And, and I'll end in a minute. Um, this is from 2018 as well, the same thing. Um, and just to kind of leave people with thought that, that what we are dealing with now is intelligence-led policing. This is a concept of policing that developed out of England, uh, you know, out of uh, Kent Constabulary, uh, which basically roots itself in behavioral surveillance and data mining. And behavioral surveillance, nothing new, it has always been going on, like predictive uh, driving while black was always predictive policing, but now this is giving it more veneer of science and pseudoscience as well. The pseudoscience of risk assessment tools, the pseudoscience of artificial intelligence, the pseudoscience of various other things, and we sit there and when we speak to our community, they're like, what world is this shit? You know, because people say, we know, because ultimately my body's a threat. One second. Oh, no, you good. I'm just looking at your um, and just some, some, some thoughts about that, how when we talk about data and democratizing the data, I would rather say we need to abolish data because data is always political. Data is political, data is always weaponized, data is always going to be a proxy for racism. So I think our fight is really more than the democratization of data, it's the abolition of data. And what does it mean, right? So, and here uh, I want to uh, end by, by leaving that what is the intellectual framework behind these things? So this is Jeff Branthingham's argument as the chair of Department of Anthropology who got a $5 million grant from the U.S. Army in 2005 to go to Iraq and Afghanistan to predict insurgencies in, on the battlefront. So from the battlefront, so this is how anthropology gets used because, of course, coming from a colonized land, you know, anthropology runs very crucial. It's, it's, it's a delicate subject for a lot of us. But this is what he says, that criminal offenders are essentially hunter-gatherers. They forage for opportunities to commit crimes. The behaviors that a hunter-gatherer uses to choose a wildebeest versus a gazelle are the same calculations a criminal uses to choose a Honda versus a Lexus. So this is the scientific evidence that is being used to create algorithms on Pret Pol algorithm, which then create those hotspots that you saw around a Skid Row as well. This is Jeff Branthingham's algorithm. And guess what? This is an ETAS algorithm, which is an earthquake predicting model. So Jeff Branthingham decided that as earthquakes happen and as they build into clusters, we can use the same algorithm into predicting crime as well because crime comes in clusters. So when I talk about junk science, when I talk about pseudoscience, this is what I'm talking about. This is another intellectual framework behind Operation Laser, which we dismantled. This is a, a PhD, Dr. Craig Yuchida, now I'm gonna say in my Desi accent, so I share my anger about it. So this is something that he talks about people, because they're the drive-bys in South Central Los Angeles, and they lifted this program, uh, the laser program stands for Los Angeles Strategic Extraction and Restoration. Because they say the program is analogous to laser surgery where a trained medical doctor uses modern technology to remove tumors. Our people, people, community members are tumors. So the tumors need to be removed. Right? This is how they, they started this program. And this was the chronic offender bulletin, which is like a most wanted poster. But the person is not wanted for anything. They say they are persons of interest, but this is the program that we dismantled because this would go out to the patrol cars. They would go and harass people and, and, and kind of write more field interview guards. And these are, so I just wanted, these are the photo. I just want to go back to one quick thing. Um, these are the laser zones which the program we dismantled. So this is where when you, when you see these density maps, do you also, when you, when you overlap this with gentrification and, 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 and development that is going on in South Central Los Angeles, these are, this is where are deemed as laser maps. Um, and then they have these anchor points. So within those, they use the city, citywide nuisance abatement to, to evict people. And it's, it's very interesting. Right now we're in the, model, in the middle of finding out that how many evictions have they used. This is from the city attorney's office. But lastly, uh, uh, I'm not going to go into this slide, but what it really shows is that how gender and poverty and race intersect as well. Because these are different segments that the LAPD has created that which is the highest threat to our system. So when you look at number 17, that's the highest threat. And when you break down the demographics of that, it is what they say is that a, an, an unmarried black woman 
head of household between the ages of 29 and 34 is the highest threat to the efficacy, the efficacy and social cohesion of an area. And they use this language, and they have deemed uh, uh, people as a threat. And this is, this is what we've been working on in social networking. I mean, this Saturday, we have a, a whole training for youth, our, our war on youth campaign, intersex countering violent extremism, preventing violent extremism, black identity extremist. And we're also lifting the MS-13, that how gang narrative is so effectively being used to put people into deportation as well, and social networking. Um, and this is what, this was Dr. Doctor. So again, the intellectual framework, and I would love to see if someone can read it clearly so we can all hear that. Can someone volunteer to read it? Any? Yes, Tawana. So that's the, the, uh, the, the, the intellectual nourishment of people like James Q. Wilson. Anybody heard that name? Mm -hmm. James Q. Wilson and George Kellogg are the two individuals who wrote that article in 1982 Atlantic uh, Monthly on broken windows. So James Q. Wilson was a, was, a, was a mentee of Dr. Edward Banfield when he was in Chicago. He was at Harvard and, and UPenn as well. So, and then of course he became, so when you, when you look at the, and he had written this book on Heavenly City amongst several books as well, and when you look at the time frame, late 60s, early 70s, Nixon is unleashing the war on gangs. He's unleashing the war on crime. He's unleashing the war on drugs, right? Immediately post-civil rights legislation as well. And then of course Ford comes in and Reagan comes in and the great liberal champion Clinton comes in and the rest is all history as well. So I wanna end on that by really just, just honoring all the work that goes on and uh, end on that note that, you know, just, and I made a note for myself on this new notebook that we got from NYU as well, <laughs> that, that organizing, and I just kind of wrote it yesterday, organizing is sharing and building collective stories and histories, and abolition is our liberation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, yeah, oh, you stay, you stay here. Okay, stay there. You got to thank you. Oh, yeah, your card. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much, Hamid. That was that was really powerful, um, and all three of you provided some really powerful insights, and and are deeply appreciated. Um, you know, one of the things that kind of I, I was going to ask um, Sharon before I heard Hamid's presentation was how do we, you know, if we think about kind of this type of surveillance state in the United States, how do we avoid getting to that place? And of course, I saw the stalker diagram you threw up, and, and I realized, in, in a lot of ways, we already ha we already kind of are in that place. We set the model, right? <laughs> um, and so, to to that end, I'm wondering, kind of, in terms of the work that you've done, Sharon, or the work that Hamid you've done, if there are any kind of lessons learned or pieces of advice or wisdom you would have to share with folks, kind of, who are pushing back in either one of these places against kind of a violence that we're talking about that, is, that has been done by technology in these spaces. Sharon, please. Well, I want to make sure that we um, bring the two of you and Hamid to our next training for our activists, and we'll translate for you. Don't worry. Um, I think there's a lot uh, we can learn um, from, from the incredible efforts that, that are happening in the States. And I have to say, for me, it's really important that you open up a whole window. That I, um, and mostly I think it's important to stop thinking about China as special. Like we think what's happening in China is so awful, blah, blah, blah. And I do make the point, yeah, it doesn't stay there in the exports, but how much commonality 
there is. And I wanted to share that just quickly how, and how we really do need to be organizing across borders. Because mm -hmm. really, we, it's actually not there here. Like, we're here. Absolutely. The diaspora communities are here. The Uyghurs are here. The Tibetans are here. So I think there's a lot that we need to, you know, there's just the reality of time and energy. There's a reality of human bodies. You know, we have only 24 hours and some people do work 30 hour days. But, you know, I think we need to figure out a way that we can support each other while keeping the focus on our own work. But I thought the three things I thought would really pick up from what you said, just there was a lot. But some of the things were the creation of others as a threat. Every, that's exactly what's happening with Tibetans. They're told that they're backward, they're dirty, um, they're uncivilized, and what China did in freeing the Tibetans from His Holiness, Dalai Lama's autocratic rule is that they brought them into the like, mo modernity. By, by taking um, herding, grazing communities which were sustainable and forcing them into concrete blocks, saying you need to modernize. So I think there's a, a lot of that and then creating this other, um, all Uyghurs are terrorists is just totally, and they so exploit that by saying to the US and the West who buy it. But I think they buy it because of appeasement strategies and it's in their interest to buy it. So, so they're like saying, yeah, we're all fighting terrorism. Oh, we get it, it's really hard. The Uyghurs are terrorists, right? So, and then exercising <coughs> identity is being terrorism. So I think that's the that's creation of others. Um, the only problem is that I think in China, the party, anyone who speaks a different voice than the official ideology is an other. And there's zero tolerance for other. The second thing is I'm very struck by whatever we want to say about the US and our, you know, our space here. Their space to organize, research, conduct surveys, make freedom of information requests, do litigation, and for all of the defects of those strategies, believe it or not, activists and people in our network are trying to do that in China. They're doing all of the above. The difference is trying to conduct a survey could be is in fact illegal, and all the results of that survey would have to be stored in a local data storage because it's data gathered, and that means somebody's going to have access to it, and that somebody is is going to be the government. So I, I was really struck by that activists in a much, much tougher totalitarian comprehensive state are also trying to, to do this litigation when the courts aren't independent, you know, when the lawyers are governing. You know, so I think that was really striking. And the playbook, that the playbook was always there. I should really say the playbook for the control in China was pre-1949, and it goes back to 220 BC. It goes back to the first uh, the Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor of China, and that the burning of books, the censoring pre-publication review, burying scholars alive, right? Um, um, uh, committing suicide by independent voices to say, I really want to show that you're wrong, rulers, listen to me. All of that has predated 1949. And it's predated it in the law. The laws had this, the Tang Code, the Song Dynasty Code, the Ming Dynasty Code had this. The difference post-1949 is this one-party state building on Marxism, Leninism, and what's happening now is Stalinism. It's purges, that's the tactic. And, and then Xi Jinping thought. So I, I, I think we, we, this might be like a horribly unhopeful view, but maybe the struggle about abuses of our dignity and our humanity actually is more than 200 years or 1,000 years, and that the battle has always been, you know, like this, this is not like, you know, Lord of the Earth, you know, it's not like, 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 like the forces of darkness and the white workers are here and, you know, the white walkers are here and like it's, it's like the final battle. I mean, it's not that kind of Nehemiah battle, but I do think there's something about the fact that the struggle will always go on because people with power will always abuse it and will abuse those with less power. So that, that's to say we just have to keep going on. Or in Chinese, jiayou, jiayou, add oil, keep going on. Um, and, and so Rashida, I'm kind of curious um, to hear from you when we think about kind of the work that you're doing and, and think about kind of accountability. Um, what are some of the biggest kind of challenges that you've faced or come up against in that piece of work? And then I'm also wondering, like, how do we move or how do we get from kind of this notion of accountability to where Hamid is talking about, which is more of an abolitionist um, framework? Big question. Um, no, so I. 
I've always been an avid believer in I think you need a variety of advocacy, so you need people who are pushing for abolition because that should be the goal. Meanwhile, I think I classify myself as like a racial realist in the, that I understand that I'm born into a society that is oppressive and likely will not change. So how can I mitigate within to make the lived reality a little bit more tolerable so we can reach that goal? Um, so it's, I think it's one understanding that that spectrum needs to exist when doing work in order to try to actualize something that is um, useful and a net benefit for all, but the question was what are the barriers to yeah. doing ad yeah. I think one of the challenges that I'm still trying to think through in this work is the tension between sort of traditional advocates and researchers in that researchers are now starting to want to organize and do advocacy work but have not traditionally worked in spaces or even worked in more diverse spaces because the reality is a lot, most of the technical research spaces are, are predominantly white and predominantly male and people who have benefited from this sort of structural and systemic biases within society. So it's a lot of work that needs to happen in that space of even educating people about structural and systemic bias because it's just some people don't get that. Um, and also the trade-offs that exist when sort of wanting to keep convenience, but not understanding that that convenience comes at the risk of oppressing others. So I think one of the challenges is one doing that education in a space that is just not familiar with the work and understanding that that education is necessary to before you engage, because one of the challenges of not even acknowledging a lot of the points that I just made is that you don't get the deference that um, should be happening to those with lived experiences and others. Um, and that, that I, I don't know, I'm just like, that is the challenge, trying to work through it, and I'm not really sure like what the actual solution is, but for now it's just trying to educate, since I am someone with the sort of position and privilege to have access to those spaces, trying to agitate and educate in those spaces as I can, so that way if sort of the more academic community chooses to continue to engage in advocacy spaces, Hopefully they engage in a way that's a little bit <laughs> less problematic. Like I, I, I'll just hand that off to maybe you to comment on because it is a tension, and I like I think that's one of the struggles is that we kind of want to bring everyone together for a common goal, but not everyone's coming from the same page, so and that can cause tension within advocacy movements right, and themselves. Right. Yeah, that was, that was actually oh, kind of, that was actually that was actually perfect. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think and and and. Abolition is not a delete button. I mean, it's not just going to, you hit it and it's going to go away. It's a journey. It's a multi-generational journey. This is something that, you know, I didn't start or we didn't start. This is, you know, it's been going on forever. Um, but I think it's also uh, critical that what do we do with the culture of resistance and how do, we, how do we keep on empowering ourselves and our communities as well. So I think there's a lot of, I mean, we talk about learning as well, but there's a lot of unlearning that needs to happen. There's a lot of decolonizing of our mind that needs to happen as well, because yes. our orientation is as such uh, that, of course, you know, I mean, I'm a parent as well, I have a daughter, but even remembering, uh, you know, cops as models, uh, role models going to their classes. But then, you know, so, so almost kind of this orientation of a fractured existence culturally as well. On one hand, there's this role model. On the other hand, this is a murderer with a gun, you know, who's, who's killing our people as well. So I think it just like, how do we then unlearn and almost reorient ourselves? Um, uh, because of course, when we talk, we have a, another project called Watch the Watchers, mm -hmm. where we go out on major rallies and mobilizations, and particularly which are which are uh, unpermitted, and then teams of, and we have videos also on teams of three people, about four different teams. We just put the cameras. And, and document everything that the agencies are doing, whether that's from private security to law enforcement to the units they've deployed, everything else, and it becomes an educational tool. So I think the, the, the bigger thing is that in that culture of resistance, the unlearning, the relearning, the reorientation, but as long as we are focused towards harm elimination, mm -hmm. that what this recent piece of uh, our work around Operation Laser and Chronic Offender Bulletin was completely like it is unacceptable. No, we're not going to sit down with you and, t and, and to negotiate that report to us every three months. Mm -hmm. You know, go and tell people that, you know, inform people that they are in a bulletin like that. No, that's bullshit. 
because harm stalker state is gonna get you one way or another. So I think these are also, we learn through history as well, that even in the history of surveillance, um, how the Maroons were completely flipping the script and doing surveillance on, uh, in, in their plantations as well. So what was their sort of organizing going on on plantations through surveillance as well? So I think this is something, uh, again, not a moment in time, but as we are thinking of oppression through history as well, we have to look at resistance through a historical lens as well. And absolutely, I mean, going back to the comparison between China and the U.S., and we think about rights, the rights were not given by any benevolent white supremacist system. The rights were not granted to us by, by plantation capitalism. The rights people fought, people died, people, you know, just picked up arms. You know, so, so in a sense that we have to honor that history as well um, and, 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 and not just limit it to that we have rights because when we look at it, and again I'll say the Constitution is a blueprint for oppression for many communities. You know, we're constantly trying to figure out what are, what is our, who has access to the language of, so, so I think just a whole lot of things said, but, uh, but it's, a, it's, it's a constant work in progress and hopefully we continue to talk about these things. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so yeah, so, so we, since we started a little bit late, we're going to end a little bit late, but what that means is we have about 10 minutes for some questions from the audience. So I see a hand up over here, um, and a hand in here in the front and in the back, and Ooh. hands all over, so. <laughs> uh, there was a survey done about the criminality of Polish Jews in Poland, and then the immigrants, same people, in the Pittsburgh area, Pennsylvania, about 1920 to 1935. And the conclusion they came up with, which is very surprising and the reason even more so, more violent crime in the American context. Same people, same sociological. And the reason that they said was automobiles. In other words, you were in an environment where you're doing a crime and you felt you could move away from that environment very fast gave you the incentive to do the violence rather than on foot or in a slow, uh, you know, technological vehicle. Now, I just brought a book yesterday, Dillinger Days. Now, his face, all those criminals, they were wanted posters, you know what they looked like, but they still committed the crime, why? Because they had faster cars. They could outrace the, the police in that. And the point that I'm getting at, it's a technological tool that I would have never thought. I would have said, oh, the guns, no, 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 or the way they were brought up, or their poverty. It actually was a technology. And we have so many new technologies going on nowadays. Who's to say that the understanding of a certain technology might bring more violence or might bring outcomes that we would never trace it to that? So I think it's become a more complicated situation in that way. Yeah. So, so just in the interest of time, I think what we might do is have, have a few people ask their questions and then kind of any one of the panels who want to respond, <coughs> respond. Um, and so if you could just you know, keep your questions to questions, that'd be great. So uh, please, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to come back to a question that came up, I think, uh, in the second panel or the first panel from yesterday um, about resources. It came up in um, Hamid's discussion and um, it's, I'm very curious about um, resources in the case of human rights in China. Um, both Hamid and Sharon, you identified sort of the resource of human relationships and collective power. Um, and Rashida, you talked about um, sort of the privileged position that you or your organization AI Now has. And my understanding is that this is an organization that was co-founded by um, people that are on the payroll of Microsoft Research Corporation as well as Google. And it has a very different position in relationship to resources. And so I'm just wondering if you can comment on that and what have been both the advantages of, say, being resource challenged and working on building a diasporic community or working in, on Skid Row, and what that tension is with those who are more resourced, for example, AI now. Great. 
Great, thanks, fantastic panel. And I think what was so brilliant about the composition of this panel is that it made explicit something that's becoming sort of clear over the couple of days, which is how the emergence of surveillance state has happened first in ways that are so class stratified and racialized and gendered, whether it's in Xinjiang and in, in, in Tibet or in uh, Skid Row or where, you know, where Kenya, wherever it is. Um, so I think that's been very, very powerful. One of the things that I'm curious about is, because we're all working in, you know, or many of us working in different contexts and different languages, but the language of math is universal. And as, you know, different organizations are deconstructing the algorithms, are there ways that we can start to share that knowledge and that information so that we can use them in different places? Maybe more of a question for Supti than uh, for the panel. <laughs> Thanks very much. Wonderful panel and a wonderful conference. I first just wanted to, to share um, a piece of information. Um, the IEEE, which is an international engineering standards company, has just issued a um, ethically aligned design publication that establishes very strong principles of, of respect for human rights and uh, engagement, well-being indicators as a, me as a measure for, for artificial intelligence applications. Um, and it was developed by philosophers, engineers, uh, private sector people, uh, social scientists. So it has what you were trying to do in New York, this whole uh, the ecology of, the, of, the, of those who are, would be both affected and have a different perspective. So I, I just suggest that as something to consider because in the end of the day, it's engineers that are making these, these systems. And, um, it's not the politicians, it's not the police. They don't, they don't know how. But if at, this, at the source, at the engineers that actually are, are starting to think about the ethics of what they're doing, um, I think it's, it's certainly a resource that's, that's worth tapping. My question is to um, uh, Tashinda and Hamid, and thank you for wonderful examples of how, how cities are, are actually trying to fight, both fight back and, and reclaim the space and also uh, be sure there's a, a responsible application. What do you consider the limits of how far y you could go in a city without having then encountering the surveillance state uh, at the federal level? And how, how would your, your efforts to reclaim uh, data and to reclaim rights uh, move up to a higher level is my question. Thank you. So, so, so the, I think the three questions kind of on the floor, um, and I'll, I'll just very quickly try to summarize them. Um, challenges and opportunities with respect to resources and resource differences. Um, the notion of kind of how do we deconstruct um, accountability and share knowledge, um, and kind of a really question about kind of turning the tools on some of the institutional actors. Um, and this notion of what are the limits um, in terms of the work that's being done in municipalities and cities um, around, around AI um, and accountability. So I'll start with the resource question. Um, I think it's first important to state that this was not my first job, so I've come from working in many nonprofits, especially under-resourced ones, and sort of having that trajectory of having to work with no resources and then being in a space where I have the privilege of having a lot of resources it's, I've tried to approach our work in ways that can't, we can't share the money, but can at least highlight the work of others so that there can be more visibility for them to get funding that they need, but also using the space since we are a research group to help build resources that otherwise don't exist or are not incentivized by foundations to create so others can build on that to do work. Um, I think one, reason I try to approach sharing or using our resources in a more constructive way is because I've had the experience of also being in an organization um, that was highly resourced and I don't think did the best job of using those resources well. Um, I think you raised the great point of the nonprofit industrial complex. That's the, inherently the issue and a lot of that stems from philanthropies. Like it's that is the problem in that a lot of us are relying on the same funding resources and they've created a structure that forces people to only want to get media, only want to hoard resources and only want to be the ones in certain rooms, which makes doing integrated advocacy very difficult. But I think 
as you have more people like myself and others who deeply care about the underlying issues and understand the importance of having more people in certain spaces, hopefully we'll start to see a shift in how that work is approached. It's, that's a very slow and I also know not satisfying answer, but that's essentially like me using my ability and my position to do the work in an important way because that's the only capacity that I can until sort of those with the institutional power and privilege can sort of shift how they're choosing to fund and support work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, 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 it, it is a, a, a delicate situation sometimes to tread, but I think um, you know, over the last nine years now since the coalition has been in existence, um, it, it constantly reminds us that what could be a model of true grassroots organizing and community power building. Um, and in that, I think this has been, at least for me, in my own history of organizing as well, this has really been a model experience. That it's coming from people who have completely, and it's, I don't want to use the words commit or dedicate and all of that because this people are living, breathing. This is something as, as organizers, as uh, when we think of justice, because I think here I'm gonna just bring in Asata, that it is our duty to fight for freedom, and it is our duty to win. So I think unless we approach uh, the, the, you know, this not as a work, but our daily, I mean, of course it's work as well. I mean, I, and, I'm, and I'm saying it from a privileged place as well, you know. But, so I think it really comes down to that how, it's not just about resources, but how are those resources deployed and how are those resources lifted and how are those resources collectively built as well? I mean, I just gave you an example of Jamie and you've met Jamie Garcia, a nurse, a full-time nurse who really just has committed her life's work to like, you know, fuck the police. I mean, I go to the hospital, I go to the hospital on the east side, I don't have enough resources or syringes, but the LAPD is getting 54% of the general funds. Why the heck is that? Why is it like, you know, the, some, the, the youth that are doing this work, and I have to bring youth into because that's where a lot of power lies. Youth Justice Coalition, these young kids coming out of gang databases, coming out of cages, who did a whole research and showed it to the county of Los Angeles that only one to three percent of your criminal justice budget, budget would result in 120 million dollars of investments in youth. And you would see that the amount of peace builders that you can bring in, the level of youth centers that you can create, this level of jobs you can create for the youth, right? But the only answer is because we, the answer has always been, that's why we talk about abolition, because policing has always been, we are always policing our way out of problems. Homelessness, police our way out of problems. Youth issues, police our way out of problems. You know, uh, trans community, police our way out of the problem. So I think this is where, so it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's a resource-based conversation, but what does that resource mean and how do we imagine that? Um, you know, it's not just the physical labor, but it's a thought process. I want to bring in Eddie H., um, you know, who, is, who has been a resident of Skid Row for the longest time. Like, you know, who really talks about uh, his history in Detroit and then moving to the, uh, to the West Coast and really brings in that how do we decolonize our mind? How do we unlearn a lot of the shit that we have been oriented with? So that's also a resource as well. So it's really like how we think of resource becomes critical because many a times it gets stuck within a materiality of dollars and cents or computers or acts, but it's really just the, 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 the conversations which are so powerful that they're completely priceless. So yeah. Can I jump in on resource? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think resources is very important and I want to say three quick things about it. One is I think there needs to be a conversation that's more productive and constructive and effective with the donor communities, and I'm including all the donors, the foundations, the aid agencies, the governments, and not that they fund us, I'm just saying that they, we need a conversation. Um, because I think that in the work that we do, the human rights area, that the whole funding model comes from the development area, and it doesn't apply in terms of metrics and indicators and statistics and what they want, quantitative results. Second thing is time frame. You don't change a society and reform it in a two-year grant. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's like a major problem. And while there's some formal acknowledgement of it, I don't see any of it operationalized. Um, they have to have a conversation about risk aversion. I think they've got to be prepared to fail. 
and like that's not a great pitch that I make, you know? I don't say, hey, give us like $50,000 and maybe you'll get nothing. You know, it's just not an effective pitch, but that's the fact. If they want to go in and fund China, they've got to be prepared to not get the success they envisioned, and they have to be prepared to rethink success. So, but we also are pushing the activists to say, we need to rethink success. So after Occupy Central, for example, 100,000 Hong Kongers, my people, were out in the streets, unimaginable. But after they cleared the streets, the dominant narrative was the young people failed. And then the young people believed it, and they said, we failed. And we were in all these youth groups, and my colleagues, and we convened like 14 groups, and we said to them, be careful about accepting the narrative of failure. What did you get? You got something phenomenal, spirit capital, the experience of building three months an outdoor community that had powered by bicycles, the lights, everything. So I think the um, human power versus, you know, I said HI, human intelligence and power, you know, with AI, I think that's really important to think about. But we need concrete resources. That's a fact. Not all of us have the luxury, you know, like I, you know, would love to volunteer my extra one hour, you know, now to do animal rights and animal rescues and stuff, which I do. But, you know, it's like you got to have concrete support. So all of our activists on the ground have to eat. They have to pay. They have to live somewhere. They need resources. And the Chinese government knows that. So that's why the Ango law was passed, the overseas NGO law, to ensure that they cut off all the blood, all the oxygen. So now the only money, support, exchanges that can go into China have to be approved, monitored by the police, the public security boom, the department. So that's what's going in. So then the funders are asking, are you guys registered and approved? I go, uh, like, no. <laughs> like human rights in China? They go, well, are you going to register or try? We go, no. Where A, we're not going to try, because B, it's like a fly swat on a you know, bloody windshield. I said, B, we don't want the registration. We don't want to submit our reports and our participants and the names of our networks on lists to the public security. That is a conversation I think the funding community has to have to stop asking about registered, approved um, stuff. I, I do want to say something about accountability, because I want to weigh in, because that was yesterday, and I think that was here, and abolition. Let me make it very clear. I'm, I'm not right now calling for the abolition of the Communist Party or the takedown of the Communist Party, and some of the activists have, but here's my own view. Even if the Communist Party collapsed today, I do not think China will become more democratic, more respect of rights, and the way that's gotta happen is from people. The society and the culture and the values have to shift. And that means we have to relearn. And that's what Liu Xiaobo said, Nobel Prize winner who died. And he said, dictators survive not because they're powerful. It's because we kneeled. But he also said we need to learn to be citizens. We can't just have this self-righteousness that we're activists and we're on the right side. He said we have to become citizens. We have to learn what that means. And I think that's why the challenge is for all of us. You know, I, I think it's not just take down the police, take down the Communist Party, take down all that. I think even if they came down, we're still going to have a culture of gender violence, of discrimination, of racism. So I, I really feel like the challenge is much deeper and longer term than two, three year, you know, on the resource. And please donate to South, stop LAPD spying coalition. <laughs> <laughs> so, so join me in thanking me, thank our panelists for a really powerful presentation. <laughs>